This video was made possible by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So, as you might know, over the years I've done quite a lot of extraction videos on this channel, ranging from taking out caffeine from coffee, to pure sulfuric acid from a car battery or silicon from dirt, but in my opinion none of them even comes close to what I have planned for this video. As you might have already guessed from the title, today's hot topic are going to be some completely average forks that we all use pretty much every day, and at first glance they don't seem interesting at all. I mean, forks are just forks, and every normal person just uses them and goes on with their life, but after doing YouTube chemistry for so long, I am far from a normal person. When I look at such a perfectly average fork, I see some iron, carbon and chromium, which are the main elements that form the stainless steel forks are made of. The iron and carbon aren't really that interesting because they are kind of everywhere, the chromium however is where things get really cool. Pure chromium is a light and shiny transition metal lying near the middle of the periodic table and it turns out that it has some really colorful and unique properties. In this video I want to try separating it from all the other fork components and turning it into a toxic, carcinogenic, oxidizing, corrosive and just overall deadly orange compound called potassium dichromate. Just hearing all these colorful descriptions of this thing makes it seem really fun and for me completely justifies making it, however I actually do this whole project not just to test my lab survival skills, because potassium dichromate turns out to have a lot of uses apart from giving people cancer. It's a versatile oxidant and I like to think of it as a gateway to a wide spectrum of other interesting and somehow even more dangerous chromium compounds, the properties of which I will definitely explore in future videos. Now, a funky orange powder really doesn't seem to have much in common with forks, and while on a chemical level they both contain chromium, just the difference in their looks foreshadows how difficult it is to turn one into the other. This process will be by no means easy or safe, so please don't try to repeat it at home. It would also probably be easier to just buy the dichromate, but as with every similar project on my channel, I do it to satisfy my chemical transformation hunger and show what's possible to make with just some basic ingredients. First, however, I really want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one advanced website creation platform designed to allow entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Using it you can easily create incredible websites whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand and use them to engage with your audience or sell anything from normal products to your time. Squarespace gives you access to amazing features like their new option for creating and selling your own online courses, which through their next generation editing technology stand out from your competition and are a great way to generate steady income. In addition, Squarespace provides you with powerful analytics tools that help you monitor and optimize every aspect of your business, as well as easy to set up video pages that by adding a paywall can be another great way to generate income. For a free trial, check out squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, the first step of turning forks into a deadly chemical is to dissolve them in something, since stainless steel is made to be really rigid, and without first bringing it into solution, not much can be done with it chemically. To start, I got all my forks out of the box I bought them in, and they look just beautifully average. For this project, practically any type of stainless steel can be used, but I've settled on forks because they don't contain anything except stainless steel are very cheap and all have the same chemical composition. Speaking of chemical composition, there are many types of stainless steels having various ratios of iron and chromium, some of them also contain nickel along with other trace metals, and before starting this extraction I needed to figure out exactly what my forks are made out of. This proved to be easier said than done since there were no meaningful markings on them or the box, and to try to find anything I scoured the whole internet. I found many similar utensils sold by the same company on Amazon, however it turns out that not even one of their descriptions specified what kind of stainless steel was used to make them and only how good and shiny they were. I was really starting to get annoyed by this, and after a few hours of searching with no definite answer, I decided to go Sherlock Holmes style. 
I picked up bits of information about my forks and through the power of deduction figured out that they are made of 18-0 stainless steel containing 18% chromium. I am pretty sure of that since online the company stated that their steel is nickel free and combined with the fact that the forks are attracted by a magnet, this is most likely the 18-0 type steel which nicely meets all these characteristics and is often used in culinary equipment. It's actually one of the worst types of stainless steel to use for utensils since it's the least strong and corrosion resistant, however it will be just perfect for this project because of its high chromium content and relatively few impurities. Now with the type of steel figured out I can start the dissolution process and I will carry it out by marinating the forks in an acid. My acid of choice in this case was some 98% sulfuric acid and I use it since I extracted a ton of it from a car battery and don't want to waste my precious hydrochloric acid, both these acids should work pretty much the same so everything just comes down to their availability. Anyway to dissolve all my forks I could just eyeball the amount of acid I had to use but I lost so much time on finding out how much chromium is in my steel that I just had to use some precision. To calculate everything I first weighed all my forks and it turns out that I have a whopping 789 grams of pork matter which makes this a really large scale project. Anyway before adding the acid I used my almighty hands to tear every fork into two pieces mainly because it was really cool to do and slightly increase the surface area. Now as I already said this is a very big scale project so for the next step I couldn't just use a good old beaker and instead settled on this big plastic container. I got all the broken forks into it and now it is time to disappear them with sulfuric acid. All my advanced mathematical calculations led me to need a whopping 920 milliliters of sulfuric acid which is about one and a half car batteries worth and it honestly just hurts to use this much of a somewhat rare reagent. Anyway to start I added just 250 milliliters of the acid into my fork container. As expected this didn't do anything because for the reaction to occur a good amount of water has to be present. I added some of it into the acid and the fork started dissolving almost immediately. Also I know that I've triggered a lot of people by doing this since you really shouldn't add water to concentrated sulfuric acid but since I am working in such a big container and have appropriate PPE everything was fine. After a few minutes the reaction really took off producing a ton of gas and making the acid solution green. In terms of what's happening here sulfuric acid attacks the chromium and iron present in stainless steel turning them into their sulfates and producing a big amount of the extremely flammable hydrogen gas which is the reason why this reaction can only be done in a fume hood or outside. Anyway at some point the reaction mixture started to get really hot softening up the plastic container a little and to prevent a disaster I added some of my fancy distilled water ice into the container to help everything calm down. After a few minutes I added in another charge of sulfuric acid and left everything to react overnight. When I came back the solution got much darker from all the chromium and a sludgy light blue precipitate of iron sulfate appeared. The forks looked pretty much exactly like before showcasing just how slow this whole process is. Anyway I added the rest of the acid to the mixture along with quite a bit of distilled water to hopefully dissolve most of the iron sludge. I now again had to wait god knows how long and I really wanted to speed this process up using some heat and since I couldn't do it using a stove because of the plastic I invented a genius way to harness the energy of the sun and heat up my fork marinade for free. It involves using a black chair as a next generation solar concentrator and I am honestly pretty proud of this stroke of genius. I left this advanced system to work for two days and when I came back quite a bit of the forks was now gone and the iron sulfate instead of forming a nasty sludge took the form of some beautiful blue crystals. Unfortunately being beautiful was their only upside because a lot of them encased my partially dissolved forks making it harder for the acid to eat them away. To fix that I again got everything onto the solar chair hoping to at least partially dissolve the crystals and left it to react for another couple of days. When I came back the forks now looked much thinner, I could theoretically let them react for some more time to dissolve them completely but I already spent like a week on this project and I am not even halfway done so I just proceeded to work with what I have. To start processing my homemade metal lemonade I got most of the partial dissolved forks out of the plastic container and drained away the vast majority of the acidic chromium water into a different container. 
This left me with a lot of these dirty iron sulfate crystals. And before proceeding further, I wanted to separate out all the entrapped chromium sulfate from them. To start, I first vacuum filtered them all to remove the bulk of the chromium solution, which I added back to the other container, and to get all the chromium from the crystals, I decided to carry out a recrystallization. To start, I dissolved some of them in a lot of hot distilled water, which I've previously used to get all the remaining chromium from the partially dissolved forks. I then vacuum filtered the hot saturated iron sulfate solution to get rid of all the insoluble junk and repeated this process a few times each time dissolving a portion of the crystals. When I was done, I now had a little over 2 liters of a saturated iron sulfate solution with some residual chromium as well as a lot of this black powder, which is some carbon that came from the stainless steel. I also recovered some more pieces of undissolved forks, which I've weighed along with the earlier ones to find out that out of the 789 grams of starting forks, I managed to dissolve only 662, which I will have to base all my future calculations upon. Anyway, now back to my iron sulfate solution. To get some crystals out of it, I first boiled away a sizable portion of it while adding everything that didn't previously fit into the beaker. When I felt that I evaporated it enough, I got it off my hot plate and put it into a fridge overnight to lower the iron iron sulfate solubility and make it crystallize out. When I got it out in the morning, there was a nice bed of some pure and beautiful iron sulfate crystals and a dark green chromium enriched solution above them. I drained away all the chromium water and off screen combined it with the rest in the container. I also really adored the beauty of these light blue fork crystals. I now had to get them out of this beaker, and this is where things started to get really tricky. They were surprisingly hard and almost impossible to get out using just a spatula, so I had to turn to some heavy duty equipment, which in this case was a drill. It made quick work of them and somehow didn't break my beaker. Using a screwdriver, I managed to get all of the crystals into a container and finally broke my only 2 liter beaker, which made me really sad, but this was kind of inevitable. I got all the crystals into a plastic bag for storage since they're a perfectly good reagent. Also, this blue crystal bag really reminded me of one particular TV show and it was just funny that I accidentally turned some forks into the finest blue product. Anyway, now after more than a week of struggle, I am left with a few liters of this dark and acidic chromium and iron sulfate solution, which I can now further process into my precious dichromate. Before doing that, however, I had to clean it up a little from all the residual fork carbon which would screw things up later on, so I quickly passed it all from a vacuum filter, which did a good job of removing a ton of this carbon powder. Now, as the next step in the dichromate synthesis, I have to react my iron and chromium sulfates with some washing soda, otherwise called sodium carbonate, to convert them into iron carbonate and chromium hydroxide. To carry this step out, I have to add roughly 1.5 kilos of sodium carbonate to my fork juice. This amount is based on the unreacted forks and the extracted iron sulfate and is still a large excess but will ensure that all my chromium reacts. To begin, I started adding the sodium carbonate really slowly, and at first it reacted with the residual sulfuric acid, forming sodium sulfate and tons of carbon dioxide bubbles. After adding about half a kilo, the reaction no longer produced as much carbon dioxide, and some green gel started to appear. This gel is a mixture of iron carbonate and chromium hydroxide, which form from their sulfates upon reacting with sodium carbonate, and they both are practically insoluble in water, precipitating as this slimy mess. Anyway, when I finished adding in all the sodium bicarbonate, the whole mixture took on this rusty lime color, which originated from the fact that the blue iron 2 plus ion present in the sludge can easily oxidize to the reddish brown iron 3 plus ion by exposure to oxygen in the air, which is why the top of the sludge will always look like rust. The chromium on the other hand isn't oxidized so easily, which is good in this case, since I will oxidize it all at once later. Anyway, to start processing this messy solution, I have to filter out the gigantic amount of sodium sulfate now present in it. Just from the looks of it, this fork mud seems almost impossible to filter, and to save some time later, I decided to leave everything to settle overnight so that I can remove a lot of the dirty water before filtering anything. 
After the whole night, the sludge settled to the bottom, leaving some clear sodium sulfate solution floating on top, and to remove it, I decided to go with the old school method of siphoning. To carry it out, I used an old piece of latex tubing and a metal bowl. It's really cool that this is essentially a power-free pump, and in just a few minutes, all of the sodium sulfate solution was gone. I was now left with a lot of still quite impure metal sludge with this rusty iron crust floating on top, and to clean it up further, there was no other option than filtration. More specifically, I have to carry out a gravity filtration, since this sludge would obliterate my vacuum filter. To start, I had to find a suitable funnel, and the largest glass one I had just wasn't going to cut it. In the end, I came up with the most amateur chemistry method involving two empty Polish water bottles with their bottoms cut out and these stupid European Union caps removed, then replaced with some cotton. I mounted them onto a lap stand, and that completed the creation of my beautiful filtration tree. I was really proud of this thing, much like my solar chair, and hoped that it would work well. To start it up, I just filled the bottles with the fork sludge and waited. The filtration speed was just horrible, but that's pretty much what I expected. I left this setup to work for two days, hoping that most of the dirty water would come through. Of course, it didn't come through, and instead of two nice and full beakers, I only filtered out some of the water, which had so much sodium sulfate in it, that a lot of these rusty crystals managed to form. They looked really cool, and honestly, me unintentionally making nice crystals is slowly becoming a theme of this video. Anyway, in the end, I've added one more branch to my filtration tree to be able to filter all the sludge at once, and even with all this mighty filtration equipment, everything moved so slowly, I felt I aged 20 years just watching this system work. In total, I must have spent nearly two weeks on this filtration, which made this project completely drain my soul and last bits of patience. I actually tried many things to make all this go faster, including using my homemade centrifuge intended for another project, but in the end, gravity filtration proved to somehow be the most effective. Anyway, after filtering probably over 5 liters of liquid, I was so fed up with this filtration, I decided to proceed further even though there was still quite a bit of sodium sulfate contaminating my sludge. I disassembled the filtration tree and got the sludge bottles into a plastic container. I now had to get everything out of them, which proved to be easier said than done, and after using like 3 liters of distilled water, I was now left with some purified fork sludge. Now it is time to oxidize the chromium from the 3 plus state it's currently in to its more dangerous and reactive plus 6 state in the form of the chromate ion. This ion is really close to my desired dichromate, and it will allow me to separate the chromium from all the iron junk, since chromates generally tend to be really soluble in water, while iron carbonates and hydroxides are nearly insoluble. To carry out this oxidation, I will have to use a really strong oxidizing agent, and for that the best thing by far is the hypochlorite ion. It's the thing that makes bleach work and has a ton of oxidizing power. In my case, I didn't want to use bleach, since the sodium ion present in it would complicate things later on, and instead I settled on a different hypochlorite-containing thing called calcium hypochlorite. It's this white powder often used as pool chlorine, and for reasons I will explain later, it will be the perfect thing to oxidize my chromium with. The oxidation reaction will involve just mixing it with my sludge, however, instead of adding it in its powdered form, I wanted to first get my calcium hypochlorite into solution, so that the reaction will happen more evenly. To prepare the solution, I first weighed out 760 grams of calcium hypochlorite, which I calculated to be roughly enough to react with all the sludge. Anyway, I got a lot of hot water into my calcium hypochlorite to dissolve it, and when the solution looked ready, I poured it all into the metal sludge. Immediately upon the addition, everything became brown due to the iron-free ions being created. The reactions going on here are quite complicated. First, the iron to carbonate gets oxidized to iron-free hydroxide, which is insoluble and stays as a suspension, while the chromium-free hydroxide gets oxidized to calcium chromate, which is soluble in water and has this pea-yellow color. The second reaction is also supposed to produce some of the deadly chlorine gas, which should bubble out of the solution, but since there is so much water around, it dissolves, making this whole thing even more dangerous than it already was. Anyway, I continue to dissolve and add the hypochlorite in portions while stirring everything to ensure a complete reaction. After about an hour, I was left with a gigantic amount of this carcinogenic and corrosive chromium mess, and I now had to filter it to remove all the insoluble iron hydroxide, which this time I decided to do using vacuum filtration. 
That's because there was no way in hell that I would spend another week waiting for this to filter, and the iron hydroxide suspension looked somewhat more filterable than the sludge before, so I got my vacuum filter and began filtering this thing. Even though I used my good vacuum pump, the fluctuation was really slow, fortunately this time it didn't take an eternity and after 4 hours I filtered all the brown iron sludge. This left me with a giant bowl full of it combined with quite a bit of unreacted calcium hypochlorite and some residual calcium chromate. Since it contains chromium 6, I couldn't just pull it down the drain or something, so I got it into these plastic bags and planned to process it sometime in the future. Apart from the iron mud, I also now have a few liters of a crystal clear calcium dichromate solution, which looks almost exactly like pee. I now had to get the dichromate out of it, which can be only achieved by boiling it down. I originally wanted to do it in this big pot, which would be really fast, but upon testing it for leaks, I discovered a microscopic hole that would cause a disaster if I filled this pot up with the chromate solution. My only other option was to boil the solution in my new 2 liter beaker, which I managed to order and receive while filtering the first sludge. To start, I got it onto my hot plate along with a stir bar and poured in the chromate solution through a cotton filter to catch any stray junk. When the beaker was full, I wrapped a lot of aluminum foil around it to keep the heat in and left it to boil for a few hours. When I came back, this weird yellow crust formed on top of the solution, and since the only yellow thing present in the beaker is calcium chromate, I was really excited that I managed to get some. I thought that more of it would crystallize out if I put this solution into a fridge overnight, but that did absolutely nothing. It turns out that calcium chromate has a very similar solubility in cold and hot temperatures, which is actually good because when all the other impurities are in solution, only it can precipitate out. I vacuum filtered out the bit of the product I managed to make and continued boiling the solution which of course took another week since I had to boil off like 4 liters of water. I ended up using my trusty lab fan to speed everything up, but even with it, it still took forever. Over the course of the week, I continued adding in more of the dilute solution and periodically filtered off the created calcium chromate powder. Also, at some point, I concentrated the solution enough that some non-chromate crystals started to appear, which signaled the end of the process. After all this struggle, I was left with quite a bit of these really yellow calcium chromate flakes that should be quite pure and are only a few reactions away from my precious potassium dichromate. Apart from the chromate, I also have quite a bit of these yellow calcium chloride crystals along with a saturated calcium chloride solution. They both still contain some calcium chromate which I could try to recover, but I decided that this just wasn't worth the effort. Before continuing the main process, I wanted to dispose of my chromate contaminated waste since I had no use for it, and I can't just pour everything down the drain since chromium-6 is ultra poisonous to marine life, and like with all the contaminated things from this project, I had to reduce the chromium back to its safer 3 plus ion. This can be quite easily accomplished by using some sodium sulfide and hydrochloric acid, which together create a very reducing environment capable of disarming chromium-6. The reduction process really nicely changed the color of the solution into this deep green. Anyway, I also reduced all the crystals and was now ready to move on with making the potassium dichromate. To turn my calcium chromate into it, I have to carry out two chemical reactions and I like to see them as the fine tuning of the chromium-6 skeleton I built using all the previous processes. I first have to take care of the chromate part since the ion I need is dichromate, which while being rather similar is not the same thing. Fortunately, it's quite easy to make it from the chromate, and all I need to do is just react it with some sulfuric acid, which kicks off one calcium of the calcium chromate, turning it into calcium dichromate and calcium sulfate. To start, I first got my gigantic beaker that I used to boil the chromate solution in, since it still had some of my product sticking to its walls. I then weighed my calcium chromate in it, and it turns out that I managed to make 62.5 grams of it. This amount is far below what I expected, but on the upside it's still quite a bit. To turn it into the dichromate, I first got it onto my hot plate and added around 400 milliliters of distilled water. Then using a stir bar, I suspended all the calcium chromate in solution and began slowly adding in concentrated sulfuric acid. 
as I already said, the acid converts the chromate to the dichromate, which you can see happening as this beautiful color change from the characteristic chromate yellow to the vivid dichromate orange. The acid also turns some of the calcium into calcium sulfate, which is insoluble in water, and that's why, even though the chromate is consumed, a cloudy suspension still remains in the beaker. This calcium sulfate formation is also the reason why I decided to make calcium chromate and not for example sodium chromate, because the created calcium sulfate can be easily filtered out, increasing my dichromate's purity. Anyway, in hindsight, I have added way more acid than I should have, which is quite a bad thing, the effects of which you will see in a minute. After completing the acid addition, I left this thing to stir for a few minutes, and then vacuum filtered it all to remove all the insoluble calcium sulfate, I also washed it many times to get every last bit of the dichromate out, and in the end I was left with this intensely orange solution. Now that I managed to make the dichromate ion, I have to swap out the still remaining calcium with potassium to finally make my potassium dichromate, and this should be pretty easy. I plan to do it by adding some potassium carbonate to my dichromate solution to turn it into potassium sulfate by the excess sulfuric acid and again precipitate out calcium sulfate leaving behind potassium dichromate. To start I wait out and slowly add it in 35 grams of anhydrous potassium carbonate which caused the solution to release a bunch of carbon dioxide bubbles made by the reaction of potassium carbonate with sulfuric acid. I then expected to see some calcium sulfate precipitate out but this solution stayed clear for some reason, and I started questioning reality because some suspicious stuff was going on here. After doing some research, I figured out what happened. It turns out that since I added way too much sulfuric acid, all the calcium got removed in the previous step, leaving me with not calcium dichromate, but something called dichromic acid. This acid is quite an interesting substance I aim to explore further in future videos, but for now the most important piece of information is that the potassium doesn't want to bond to it, since there is still too much sulfuric acid around. To destroy some of it, I transferred the solution to a smaller beaker and boiled away some water to make space for a few milliliters of a concentrated potassium hydroxide solution, which upon addition neutralized some of the sulfuric acid and almost immediately precipitated something I originally thought to be some ghost calcium from god knows where, but since there were small crystals visible, it was probably just some potassium sulfate produced by the neutralization. It was quite weird to see it precipitate like that since it's extremely soluble in water, but since I currently didn't have the mental capacity to play Sherlock Holmes, I just didn't ask questions and filtered this stuff out. I then boiled the solution down even more and again filtered off some potassium sulfate crystals that appeared, I then put everything into a fridge overnight to hopefully crystallize out some potassium dichromate. When I came back in the morning, I was greeted by a lot of small orange crystals floating around in the solution, and I was just ecstatic. I quickly filtered off the solution and got the beautiful, vivid orange crystals onto a dish. Hell yeah. It's really quite funny how something so stupendously dangerous can be so pretty, but that's pretty much a rule in chemistry. Anyway, to squeeze more of the dichromate from the remaining solution, I boiled it down and again put it into a fridge, which yielded some more of these amazing crystals. I got them all into my oven to dry for a few hours, to in the end leave me with some nice and dry potassium dichromate crystals. Just seeing them made me really happy and excited, this whole project took the longest amount of time in terms of producing a single video on my channel so far, and looking back on a literal month of struggles, it's been quite a journey. Through many chemical transformations, I turned some average forks into a range of beautiful and toxic colors which through some sheer coincidence indicate the danger of the respective chromium compound and did all that work to produce a small amount of some cool crystals. When it comes to the yield, I managed to make almost exactly 40 grams of potassium dichromate, which corresponds to roughly 12% yield from the starting forks, which is astonishingly small but not tiny, and I think that all this struggle was well worth it. When it comes to my product's purity, it is definitely quite high, but this powder still has tiny beads of potassium sulfate mixing with the dichromate crystals, which I could remove by recrystallization, but since potassium sulfate won't interfere with any reaction I plan to use my dichromate for, I just didn't bother. I will use my homemade dichromate in a future video to make some of the incredibly dangerous chromium trioxide and use it to showcase even more of chromium's incredible chemistry, so stay tuned. 
For now, I have to thank you all very much for watching what was the most draining project on my channel so far. I hope that you've learned something from it and enjoyed it. If you did, you can like this video, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. If you want to further support my work and gain access to exclusive content unsuitable for YouTube, as well as having your name displayed at the end of every video, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, I want to give a gigantic thank you to all my wonderful Patreon members for their support which allows me to make such gigantic projects and see you guys in the next video.